Good evening, shalom, blessings to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and shalom. I think I already said shalom. Anyways, welcome to this episode of Unapologetics, where we are unapologetic about apologetics, and I am your host, C.J. Cox. Um, got some important stuff to be discussing here today, uh, things that I think are vitally important for sure, but before we do, let's go ahead and say a brief prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for everything that you blessed us with, Lord. I want to thank you for the ability to make these videos, Lord, for the ability to read your word, to study your word, Lord, to have political and religious opinions, Lord. Uh, we talk a lot about, you know, coming persecution and things like that, Lord, but in the meantime, you have kept us very safe, Lord, and, and very much in, in a lot of luxury, Lord. I apologize for my story. I just thank you for all of that, Lord. I thank you for everything that you blessed us with. I pray that you use this video for nothing more than the glorification of your kingdom and your word. That you guide us all to repentance, Lord, and to seek you further, to fellowship with the Holy Spirit, Lord, and be baptized in it and washed in your blood, that we might be made clean as a white silk or Lord. And I pray that all these things in Jesus Christ's holy name, and we give you the glory. Amen. All right. So, a few announcements. Um, so, obviously, first and foremost, we want to announce uh, GraceNampa.org, right? G R A C E N A M P A dot O R G. If you are interested in some absolutely fantastic church services, they are absolutely incredible. I, you know, I, I'm not, un, you know, I know I say this at the beginning of pretty much every episode here. Um, I actually do say it at the beginning of every episode, but. I don't say it as like an endorsement. It's not like they give me money or anything like that. They just genuinely have absolutely fantastic church services. Um, the pastor there, the main pastor, is a phenomenal pastor. All the guest pastors are phenomenal. All of the like secondary pastors who preach there are phenomenal. The hymns are phenomenal. The song leader is phenomenal. Um, it, it's traditional in, in, the, in the sense of that, um, you know, there's no, there's no rock band there, right? It's an actual, they were singing actual hymns. Um, there's no, you know, uh, violation of biblical norms, such as, you know, accepting, um, accepting things like, you know, short skirts in the sanctuary and things like that, right? It's very, they take themselves seriously, they fellowship with the Holy Spirit seriously, they preach the Word of God seriously and believe it seriously, and I absolutely adore that church, and I would certainly recommend that you guys check it out. It's gracenampa.org, G-R-A-C-E-N-A-M-P-A dot O-R-G. And they post um, services every Sunday morning. Um, I believe they have a Sunday evening communion service that they post once a month or once every other month. Um, and also Wednesday evening services every Wednesday evening. Uh, so definitely check those out. They are absolutely fantastic. Um, next announcement, we do have uh, a possibility of a... William Branham debate coming up. You, of course, if you are a fan of this show, will remember that back in um, back in March, it was supposed to be March 10th of this year, we were going to have a debate on the show between Rod Bergen and Pastor Boitamelo Madiba about whether or not William Branham was a prophet of God. It was going to be a formal debate, and I was going to be moderating. Um, and it was actually going to be the first debate, and still, if it does happen, still will be the first debate on this topic, at least in the English language. Um, that ended up falling through for uh, reasons of scheduling difficulties, and then I got in contact with Dr. Rod Bergen again, and actually went on his program off the shelf, his podcast, where we did roughly two, two and a half hours of recording that has been split up into four parts, and I believe three of the parts have been posted so far. Um, well, I used that opportunity to see if I could get Mr. Bergen to um, try and come onto the show for a debate again. And so far, he seems to be willing. We don't know that for a fact, so I don't want anybody to get their hopes up too much. Uh, we also have yet to have confirmation from Pastor Madiba as to whether or not he would be willing. Um, but nonetheless, we are definitely actively trying to get this debate started. Um, the the uh, thesis, again, of course, would be, was William Branham a prophet of God? Rod Bergen would be taking the negative, and Pastor Madiba would be taking the affirmative, or whoever replaces Pastor Madiba, um, if he is not able to do so. Uh, and we definitely want to make sure we can get this debate up. I, I would like to see it happening before the end of the year. Um, quite, uh, excuse me. Quite frankly, if it does not happen before the end of the year, I won't be disappointed so long as it happens. And of course, if it's not God's will, then it's not God's will. But um, I believe right now, at least, that it is a very vitally important topic to discuss. And I would love to see the debate happen here. I can promise both parties equal time, equal treatment, fair treatment, um, and unbiased moderation on my part. And I won't be you know, commenting before or after on the debate. 
Um, well, I mean, on a later episode, of course I would, but I don't mean in the episode itself. They would also be receiving full copies of the debate, and it would be unedited. So there's the, um, we're going to try and play it by the rules as well as we possibly can, make sure everybody is comfortably accommodated, and go for a real pursuit of truth and debate here on this conversation. If you guys would like to see that happen, um, let your voice be heard on Twitter, on Gab, on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube. Um, let Pastor Maidiba know, let Pastor Bergen know, respectfully, of course, right? You don't want to hassle them or harass them, but just let them know that this is something that you would be interested in. If you'd like to see a debate on this topic, just let them know that you would like to see your side, whatever it is, represented by them, and that you think this topic would be an important one. Um, obviously, when they have support from genuine fans that say that they would like to see this happen, it, is always, it always helps in... Um, convincing them to do so, right? I know it certainly would can help convince me to do so if it was something I wasn't quite sure about doing or something that I like maybe wanted to do but had some skepticism around, right? Um, then, of course, um, you know, it would, it would help to know that my fans would actually like to see that. So, so um, definitely let them know. Tweet at them. And respectfully, of course. Do it all respectfully in a First Peter 3.15 kind of way. Um... Anywho, I think that is actually all announcements we've got for today. I got some ones that we'll do at the end, but they're just basic closing argument, not closing argument, but closing uh, announcements. So uh, today's subject is actually going to be uh, Brett Kavanaugh and the whole uh, rape allegation thing in in comparison, or not in comparison, but in um, in light of the Bible, what, what does the Bible have to say about this situation? Does God have anything to say about Brett Kavanaugh and the Brett Kavanaugh situation? And if so, what is it? Right. Um, and I believe he does. I believe that the Lord has an awful lot to say about this situation. In either case, if Kavanaugh is, in fact, a rapist and is guilty of rape, then I believe the Bible has a very, very harsh condemnation of him and a lot to say about this topic. And also on the other side, um, if uh, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford is in fact lying, then um, the Bible has a, an equal amount to say about it as well. Uh, sorry, I'm going to get my head on. It's kind of cold here. Anyways, um, so briefly, I mean, if, you, if you guys don't know the situation, I'll, let, I'll fill you in briefly. We're going to actually read an article on the situation from about a week ago um, to explain it in further detail, but just to briefly cover uh, the basic points. Uh, Brett Kavanaugh was nominated by Donald Trump, President Donald Trump, to be a Supreme Court Justice. Um, this was because I believe it's Anthony Kennedy, if I'm not mistaken, uh, had just recently announced his retirement from the Supreme Court. Um, and, and so now, of course, they needed a, uh, another justice to be on. Ooh, excuse me. Um, so uh, Trump nominated him, and then after Trump nominated um, Mr. Kavanaugh, Justice Kavanaugh, uh, he is now Justice Kavanaugh. He has been confirmed as of today. This is being recorded October 6th. You'll be seeing it October 7th, but I'm recording it October 6th. At any rate, uh, he, you know, so Justice Kavanaugh, after he was uh, nominated, there started to be some outrage about you know whether or not he would be super big on um, repealing Roe v. Wade. And of course, I'll, I'll talk about that briefly in a moment. But nonetheless, um, eventually... A, uh, a person, a former Yale classmate, I believe, or a former high school classmate, rather, by the name of Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, uh, came out with accusations against Brett Kavanaugh that he had apparently uh, raped her. Um, and she said it happened either 36 or 35 years ago. She couldn't quite remember the year. Um, and then, of course, there was a big movement as to whether or not this, should, um, this nomination should go through. If, in fact, he was rapist, this was originally shared to Senator Dianne Feinstein via a letter. And uh, Feinstein brought it to the attention of the Senate Judiciary Committee, who since has had a FBI investigation and a Senate hearing on the matter, both of which came back with nothing on the part of the uh, accuser. And we have since moved forward and received an 11 to 10 vote confirming, um, or 58 to 40, uh, 11 to 10 vote uh, on the Judiciary Committee and 58 to 48 or 50 to 48 confirming on the Senate vote to get uh, Justice Brett Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court. Uh, so that's the, the basics that we have here. Um, again, I do think that in either situation, the Bible has an awful lot to say about this, regardless of who is actually telling the truth, whether that be uh, Justice Kavanaugh or Dr. Ford. Um, 
That's strange. I just got a message about Nevada voter registration. I don't live in the state of Nevada. Anyways, I am going to now read a news article about the situation to kind of give you more of a um, context and understanding about this. Now, we might actually watch some highlights from the um, Kavanaugh hearings as well. This is from CBS News. It was actually posted originally on September 27th of 2018, which is at this point about uh, 10 days ago. But nonetheless, it does provide context as to everything that is going to be talked about here. Uh, this is Emily Tillett, Grace Siggers, and Catherine Watson writing for CBS News in this article. Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh and Dr. Christine Blasley Ford, who has accused Kavanaugh of sexual assault when they were both teenagers, uh, both testified before the Senate Judici Judiciary Committee on Thursday. Ford said during her testimony that she was 100% sure that Kavanaugh assaulted her, while Kavanaugh said that he was 100% sure that he did not have anything, uh, that he had not done anything of the kind. The differences are irreconcilable, well, obviously, right? After the full day of dramatic testimony, Kavanaugh's supporters in the Senate were largely ready to move forward with his confirmation vote, though a few key senators remained undecided Thursday night as his confirmation hangs in the balance. The Judiciary Committee is scheduled to vote on Kavanaugh's confirmation Friday. Here are the major takeaways from the hearing. Senators believe Ford is credible, and she is 100% sure Kavanaugh assaulted her. Judge, uh, Judge Kavanaugh's accuser, Christine Blasley Ford, provided an emotional recounting of the alleged assault, which she, which, excuse me, which she says took place when both were in high school. While there are gaps in her memory, the exact time and place, how she got home afterwards, her reconciliation was vivid. Uh, overcome with tears several times, Ford slowly and softly detailed her experience of being pinned to a bed at a high school party as a 15-year-old sophomore as she said Kavanaugh put a hand over her mouth to stifle her screams and his friend Mark Judge stood by, alternatively goading him on and telling him to stop. Alternatively goading him on and telling him to stop. Rather. Rather. Contradictory there, but that... Okay. Now, I would just like to briefly state here that this article is being... Um, slightly disingenuous in its support and bias towards Christine Blasey Ford. Um, it says that she did not remember the exact time. Well, it's one thing to not remember the exact time or even the exact day, but she doesn't even remember the exact year. She has said both 1982 and 1983. So I just want that to be pointed out here for the record. Um, also, when they say the recollection was vivid, um, that's awfully strange considering the fact that she was unaware as to the street that the house was on, she was unaware as to what room that it happened in, whether or not it was upstairs or downstairs, uh, there was numerous questions she was not able to answer, so I just want to point out this article is very, very clearly biased in the, um, in believing Dr. Ford, which of course is it's right. Judge has issued two statements via his attorney denying any rec uh, recollection of the behavior or incident described by Ford, the most recent one being a letter addressed to committee chairman Chuck Grassley and ranking Democrat Senator Dianne Feinstein after the hearing on Thursday. In that letter, Judge says he, do he does, quote, not recall the events described by Dr. Ford in her testimony before the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee today, never saw Brett act in the manner Dr. Ford described. I never saw Brett act in the manner Dr. Ford describes, end quote. So the only other witness there, uh, other than Ford and Kavanaugh, Mike Judge, says that he did not recall anything of the sort happening. The most visceral response Ford gave was during questioning by Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont, a Democrat who uh, asked what the strongest memory she had from her alleged encounter with Kavanaugh. Uh, was with Kavanaugh. Ford, a doctor of psychology who wove clinical language into her responses throughout the hearing, replied that it was her um, assailant's laughter. Quote, indelible in the hippocampus is the laughter, the laughter, the uproarious laughter between the two, and they're having fun at my expense, end quote, she said of Kavanaugh and Judge. Ford offered compelling and at times scientific explanations about her memory and the long-term impact of the assault, leaving many lawmakers, including concerned Republicans, assessing her story as truthful and credible. Ford, with quite certainty, answered questions and pushed back against suggestions that perhaps she had misremembered who carried out the assault on her uh, during a high school party. Asked outright if her allegations of assault were a case of mistaken identity from over 30 years ago, 
Ford responded, quote, absolutely not, end quote. She later testified that she was 100% certain that it was Kavanaugh who carried out the assault. Ford testified that in the years since, she has experienced anxiety, phobias, and PTSD-like symptoms. In the immediate uh, years following the incident, Ford said she suffered academically and had difficulties forming friendships, particularly with men. Prosecutor Rachel Mitchell had a muted presence in hearings. Republicans on the Judici Judiciary Community had chosen, or committee rather, had chosen Mitchell to act as special counsel during the hearing, with the exception that they would yield their time to her uh, to ask the witness questions. Mitchell is a career prosecutor with decades' experience prosecuting sex crimes. comes from the um, comes from the Maricopa County Attorney's Office in Phoenix, Arizona, where she has the Special Victims Division, which covers sex crimes and family violence. Uh, Mitchell was the only person to question Ford on the Republican side. She said a friendly, uh, she had a friendly presence, but her line of questioning was more based on procedure than the core allegation itself. She asked Ford about how she had arrived at the hearing. Ford, who lives in California, had previously expressed her fear of flying, although she acknowledged she took a plane in the instance and also has flown on vacations. And she, um, and she asked a few questions about who had paid for a polygraph test Ford has taken. She asked Ford about where she lived and about her relationship with the people involved in her allegations. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, during Kavanaugh's testimony, Mitchell was sidelined. Although she asked him questions on behalf of Senator Chuck Grassley and Senator John Cornyn, uh, the remaining senators each interacted with Kavanaugh personally. Mitchell had been chosen in part because Republicans were wary of what it would look like to have 11 men questioning a female sexual assault victim. This was not a concern during Kavanaugh's testimony, which of course makes sense. Republicans see, Kavanaugh, see Kavanaugh's testimony as a win. Republicans were concerned that Ford's compelling testimony might do damage to Kavanaugh's nomination. Kavanaugh's angry and emotionally charged opening remarks and exchanges with Democrats brought him back from the brink. Quote, this confirmation process has become a national disgrace, end quote, he said, chastising the Democrats. Quote, since my nomination in July, there's been a frenzy on the left to come up with something, anything, to block my confirmation. Um, end quote. Advise and consent, he said, has been replaced by search and destroy. And real quick, I do just want to state, I just noticed this, uh, that I'm calling them Republicans and Democrats rather than uh, Re Republicans and Democrats. Um, this, is, this is a reference to a book by Jesse Ventura. Uh, referring to them as gangs, just to get you guys uh, all caught up on that. Anyways. Kavanaugh had released prepared remarks on Wednesday in advance of the hearing, but opted instead to deliver a rebuke of the last two weeks of the confirmation process. He slammed Democrats for crafting a smear campaign against him as a series of accusers, including some who remained anonymous, continued to come forward in the days following his initial confirmation hearing. He called the procedures a circus, suggesting that the last two weeks of the confirmation process has been, quote, a calculated and orchestrated political hit, end quote, perhaps even retribution for Democrats, blah, 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 Democrats, Democrips is what I meant to say, but I mixed it with Kratz, and that came out as Kratz, and that's not what I meant, Democrips, anyways, outrage over the 2016 presidential election. Quote, what comes around, comes around. Uh, what goes around, comes around, as I'm sure what he meant to say. What comes around, comes around. I am an optimistic guy. I always try to be on the sunrise side of the mountain to be optimistic about the day that is coming, end quote, Kavanaugh said, quote, but today I have to say that I fear for the future, end quote. Citing the impact on his family, Kavanaugh broke down in tears, saying the process had permanently destroyed them. He described how his 10-year-old daughter told his wife, quote, we should pray for the woman, quote, end quote, who accused him. <clears throat> he was asked to provide explanations for the notations on his 1982 calendar, his high school yearbook, his activities as a high school student, and his penchant for drinking beer. Republicans opted to ask their own questions instead of relying on the appointed outside prosecutor in order to defend Kavanaugh and launch their own attacks on Democrats. Kavanaugh had aggressive exchanges with senators, often turning the questions back, in, back onto them. Asked about his drinking by Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, a Democrat from Rhode Island, Kavanaugh said he liked beer, then asked, what do you like to drink? 
which I actually, I, you know, it's a fair point. I mean, I'm sure that man probably likes to drink beer as well, especially as a um, college student. Um, and drinking beer does not make one guilty of the crime of rape. That's just a fact. He stumbled during one notable exchange with Senator Amy Klobuchar, Klobuchar, I don't know if I said that right, a Democrat from Minnesota. She mentioned her father's alcohol abuse and asked Kavanaugh whether he ever, quote, drank so much that he didn't remember what happened the night before or part of what happened, end quote. Kavanaugh responded, quote, you're asking about a blackout, blackout, I don't know, have you, end quote. Uh, Klobuchar asked again, quote, could you answer the question, Judge, I just, so that uh, so that's not what happened. Is that your answer? End quote. Kavanaugh turned the question on her again, saying, "Quote, yeah, and I'm curious if you have." End quote. Quote, I have no drinking problem, Judge. End quote. She said, "Quote, nor do I." End quote. Said Kavanaugh. Quote, okay, thank you. End quote. Said Klobuchar. After the break, however, Kavanaugh apologized for turning the question on here. Quote, I'm sorry I did that. This is a tough process. He said, I'm sorry about that. End quote. But it was the fiery exchanges during Kavanaugh's testimony that left the White House, namely President Trump, pleased with the judge's performance. President Trump tweeted shortly after the hearing, um, concluded, quote, Judge Kavanaugh showed America exactly why I nominated him. Excuse me. His testimony was powerful, honest, and riveting, end quote. A White House official later confirmed to CBS News that the administration was, quote, much happier, end quote, than the Republican senators took, um, that the Republican senators took over the questioning of Kavanaugh, describing the mood at the White House as collectively feeling emboldened by Kavanaugh's passionate testimony, um, according to the official. <coughs> Excuse me, let me get a drink of my coffee here. South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham condemned his Democratic colleagues for their handling of the confirmation process, calling what Kavanaugh has experienced a sham. Uh, Graham declines to defer to Mitchell and question Kavanaugh himself, creating a president followed by subsequent Republicans. He accused the Democrats of opposing Kavanaugh's nomination for their own political ends. Quote, if you wanted an FBI investigation, you could have come to us, end quote, Graham said, after Democrats on the committee have called for an FBI investigation into Ford's claims. Quote, what you want to do is destroy this guy's life, hold the seat open, and hope you guys win in 2020. You've said that, not me, end quote. He also pointed out that he had voted for Sonia Sotomayor and Elena Kagan, two of President Barack Obama's nominees, to the court. Quote, when you see Sotomayor and Kagan, tell them that Lindsey Graham, uh, tell them that Lindsey said hello, end quote, Graham said, indicating that he believes Kavanaugh will be confirmed. Quote, because I voted for them, I would never do to, uh, do to them what you've done to this guy. This is the most unethical sham since I've uh, been in politics. And if you really wanted to know the truth, you sure as hell wouldn't have done what you've done to this guy, end quote. Graham's line of questioning was notable because it reset the tone of the Republican response to Ford allegations. Instead of deferring to Mitchell to ask calm, procedural questions, Republicans after Graham instead often used their time to defend Kavanaugh and ask him softball questions. Graham has been a passionate defender of Kavanaugh, and his performance at the hearing ushered in other Republican remarks firmly defending the nominee as well. The toxic state of politics in the Senate at this moment was evident throughout Kavanaugh's portion of the hearing. Democrats unsuccessfully pushed for an FBI investigation. This is, of course, being written before um, the FBI investigation that we have had. So, no, when I read this portion of the article that it is slightly inaccurate, we have now had a completed FBI investigation. Some Democrats in the hearing pushed Kavanaugh to call for an FBI investigation into the unproven allegation against him. Kavanaugh suggested that he will do whatever the committee needs. Senator Dick Durbin, a Democrat from Illinois, asked Kavanaugh to turn around to White House Counsel Don McGahn, or McGahn um, seated in the front row, and ask him to push an FBI investigation. Quote, I've got a suggestion for you right now. Turn to your left in the front row to Don McGahn, uh, counsel to President Donald Trump, Durbin said. Quote, ask him to suspend this hearing and nomination process until the FBI completes its investigation and the charges made by Dr. Ford and others and goes to bring witness uh, forward and provide the information to this hearing, end quote. Neither Kavanaugh nor the committee has the ultimate authority to instigate such an investigation. Once the allegation was referred to Kavanaugh's background, um, was referred to Kavanaugh's background file, only the president could push for any such further investigation. 
And President Trump has made it clear that he thinks this is a matter for the committee. And of course, bear in mind that this, um, this did already happen, right? So this is slightly inaccurate at this point. Uh, Senator Mike Lee, a Utah Republican, criticized Democrats for calling, uh, for using their time to call for an investigation. Um, for calling for using their time to call for an FBI investigation instead of questioning Kavanaugh on what happened. That was a very weird way to phrase that sentence. Kind of sucks to call people like Ted Cruz, Mike Lee, Rand Paul, Republicans when I'm actually fans of them. But hey, they're part of the political gang. It's not my fault. A vote delay seems unlikely. Republicans are huddling after the Kavanaugh hearing, but at this point, a delay in the vote process seems more unlikely than likely. The Senate Judiciary Committee had already scheduled a vote on uh, Friday vote on Kavanaugh, which did not end up happening, by the way. President Trump, who had said he wanted to hear uh, what Ford had to say, tweeted after the hearing concluded that a vote needs to happen. He did not mention Ford. Quote, Judge Kavanaugh showed America exactly why I nominated him, end quote, the president tweeted. Quote, his testimony was powerful, honest, and riveting. Democrats' search and destroy strategy is disgraceful, and this process has been a total sham, an effort to delay, obstruct, and resist. The Senate, the Senate must vote, end quote. Senator John Cornyn, a Republican member of leadership, told reporters he sees no reason to delay the vote. Senator Orrin Hatch also said he sees no reason for a delay, and Orrin Hatch is actually a uh, Democrat from Oregon. All right, so that is the situation there. Um, some of the things that are actually not mentioned in this situation are, are in this particular article, rather. Um, are the fact that there were, were two other allegations against uh, Kavanaugh as well. One of them, uh, the second one, came from an anonymous uh, speaker who eventually did reveal herself, whose name I actually cannot remember at the moment. Uh, nothing really ended up coming of it, um, and it kind of just died down. The third one ended up actually being pretty significant because it kind of completely discredited the Democratic side on this matter. Uh, the creepy porn lawyer, lawyer, Michael Avenatti, the guy who was representing Stormy Daniels in her case to try and win back the rights to discuss the um, alleged Donald Trump affair, right? He actually claimed that he had a, um, a credible witness, and he made very sure to make sure she was super credible, right? Saying she's uh, part of the DOJ and all that kind of stuff and a bunch of nonsense, right? Um, and she said that Kavanaugh was actually leading uh, gang rape um, gang rape uh, parties, essentially, at, at college in Yale, and that she was attending these parties, that she had attended over a hundred of these parties before she herself was eventually gang raped. And of course, I'm sure you can see the litany of problems with that particular situation, considering Michael Avenatti is a celebrity lawyer who is representing a porn star, who is using this to only further her own uh, porn uh, career, right? Considering the fact that this woman is claiming she actually went to a hundred separate gang rape parties before eventually being gang raped herself. None of these a hundred women came forward. She never came forward. She continuously went to the parties. You can, of course, see the problem here. And, of course, that's actually probably why this article didn't want to mention it, because it does have a very strong bias towards believing Dr. Ford, which, again, is their prerogative. And um, that just wouldn't really fly very well if they were listening to that particular portion. Now, I do want to hear, there's a seven minute, uh, 12 second video here that shows some highlights from the uh, situation. I would like to listen to it now. The highlights from the hearing, that is. They christened me on rock. So uh, we have an ad at the moment, so please do bear with me for the ad here. Thank you, Freedom and Adventure, for giving me this rugged, civilized um, yeah, I am not endorsed by the people saying this ad, just for the record. I always want to point that out. But. Good evening, I'm Jeff Glor in Washington, and we are going to begin with a dramatic, emotional, historic day on Capitol Hill. College professor Christine Blasey Ford accused U.S. Appeals Court Judge Brett Kavanaugh of drunkenly sexually assaulting her at a party when they were teenagers. Kavanaugh, the president's nominee to the Supreme Court, denied it, accusing Democrats in the panel of turning advice and consent into search and destroy. Both swore under oath they were telling the truth. CBS News has learned key Republicans will be meeting tonight with Kavanaugh's confirmation hanging in the balance. We have a team of correspondents covering the Senate Judiciary Committee hearings, beginning with Nancy Cordes on the Hill. 
21 senators sat silently as Professor Christine Blasey Ford relayed what she says Judge Brett Kavanaugh and his friend Mark Judge did to her at a small gathering in 1982. I drank one beer. Brett and Mark were visibly drunk. I was pushed from behind into a bedroom across from the bathroom. I couldn't see who pushed me. Brett and Mark came into the bedroom and locked the door behind them. I was pushed onto the bed and Brett got on top of me. Brett groped me and tried to take off my clothes. He had a hard time because he was very inebriated and because I was wearing a one-piece bathing suit underneath my clothing. I believed he was going to rape me. I tried to yell for help. When I did, Brett put his hand over my mouth to stop me from yelling. It was hard for me to breathe, and I thought that Brett was accidentally going to kill me. Ford, a psychologist, sometimes relied on clinical terms to describe her experience. What is the strongest memory you have? The strongest memory of the incident, something that you cannot forget. Indelible in the hippocampus is the laughter, the, la the uproarious laughter between the two, and they're having fun at my expense. The 11 Republicans, all of them men, most of them lawyers themselves, ceded their time to an Arizona prosecutor and sex crimes expert. My name is Rachel Mitchell. Nice to meet you. She probed gently for gaps in Ford's story. You said that you do not remember how you got home, is that correct? I do not remember. Has anyone come forward to say to you, hey, remember, I was the one that drove you home? No. Or Democrats repeatedly pointing out, you know you are not on trial. <laughs> this is not a trial of Dr. Ford. It's a job interview for Judge Kavanaugh. Their questions took aim at the GOP theory that this is a case of mistaken identity. Dr. Ford, with what degree of certainty do you believe Brett Kavanaugh assaulted you? 100%. 100%. Ford said the trauma left lifelong damage. More specifically, claustrophobia, panic, and that type of thing. Which is why she initially sought to remain anonymous. I was calculating daily the, the risk benefit for me of coming forward and wondering whether I would just be jumping in front of a train that was headed to where it was headed anyway, and that I would just be personally annihilated. How did you decide to come forward? Uh, ultimately, because reporters were sitting outside of my home and trying to talk to my dog through the window. After about four hours, a defiant Judge Kavanaugh took her place. My family and my name have been totally and permanently destroyed <laughs> by vicious and false additional accusations. I was not at the party described by Dr. Ford. This confirmation process has become a national disgrace. Since my nomination in July, there's been a frenzy on the left to come up with something, anything, to block my confirmation. Some of you were lying in wait and had it ready. This first allegation was held in secret for weeks by a Democratic member of this committee and by staff. This whole two-week effort has been a calculated and orchestrated political hit. You may defeat me in the final vote. But you'll never get me to quit. As he went on, his anger gave way to emotion. The other night, Ashley and my daughter Liza said their prayers. And little Liza, all 10 years old, said to Ashley, we should pray for the woman. It's a lot of wisdom from a 10 year old. We mean, we mean no ill will. He referred to the calendars he kept in 1982. So let me emphasize this point. If the party described by Dr. Ford happened in the summer of 1982 on a weekend night, my calendar shows all but definitively 
that I was not there. The prosecutor, Mitchell, questioned him too. Did you consume alcohol during your high school years? Yes, we drank beer. I liked beer. Still like beer. We drank beer. The drinking age, as I noted, was 18, so the seniors were legal. If you're very confident of your position and you appear to be, why aren't you also asking the FBI to investigate these claims? Senator, I'll do whatever the committee wants. I wanted a hearing the day after the allegation came up. I wanted to be here that day. Republicans like Lindsey Graham came to Kavanaugh's defense. This is the most unethical sham since I've been in politics. And if you really wanted to know the truth, you sure as hell wouldn't have done what you've done to this guy. Are you a gang rapist? No. To my Republican colleagues, if you vote no, you're legitimizing the most despicable thing I have seen in my time in politics. Blasey Ford insisted that politics had nothing to do with it, noting that she made her first anonymous tip before Kavanaugh was even nominated when he was still on the short list with several others. But Republicans countered again and again today, Jeff, that it was Democrats who injected politics into this when they held on to those anonymous pieces of information for weeks. Nancy Cordes, thank you. Uh, and I do want to um, briefly correct the record here. It did say that um, the, the the lady there did say that um, she had made this anonymous tip before uh, before Kavanaugh had ever been nominated. Now this is sort of accurate ish. Um, she didn't write the letter to Senator Feinstein until a list showing Kavanaugh's name on it was already. Um, was already presented as actually is admitted by CBS there, but um, on top of that, the the 2012 incidents where she allegedly told her therapist that she was raped did not mention Kavanaugh by name, nor did it mention a judge, nor did it mention a lawyer, nor did it mention anything that would indicate that it was Kavanaugh. Um, and quite frankly, it's even hearsay at that point that just kind of relates as to whether or not like do you uh, actually believe the. Uh, doctor, which of course is uh, your prerogative there. Now, there are interesting things to note on this particular situation. The first thing, and I will be perfectly frank with you guys, I do not come in this situation with um, no bias. I have seen personally more situations of females lying about being raped than who have been raped. My situation, I admit, is definitely rare. Okay, so I'm not here saying that the vast majority of rape crimes are. Uh, false accusations, okay? Quite the opposite. That being said, though, my personal anecdotal experience is with uh, those who have accused falsely, and so I'm not exactly keen on just, quote, believing survivors. Um, that being said, though, if you can prove somebody beyond any shadow of a doubt to be guilty of the crime of rape, then they should be executed. Now, I do firmly believe in the death penalty for sexual assault crimes, specifically violent rape, uh, penetrative rape, or uh, pedophilia of any kind, right? I definitely think we need to have a minimum of the death penalty for those situations, but you need to prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that the person is guilty, and they need to remain innocent until proven guilty. One of the things that very much disappoints me about this situation is the fact that many people, Saturday Night Live, CNN, uh, numerous other celebrities like Ellen, De Ellen DeGeneres, Jim Carrey, and all these people who actually have a significant amount of political leeway in our culture, they consistently come out and say, Kavanaugh is definitely guilty. We can't have him on the Supreme Court. Senator Cory Brooker, a Democrat from California, actually made the claim that it didn't matter if Kavanaugh was innocent or guilty um, and that he should be done away with anyway. So we certainly see, you know, even though people said that this isn't for political purposes, we certainly see that this is something that was done for political purposes on the point of the Democrats. Now, that doesn't have anything to do with Dr. Ford, okay? She could still have a legit testimony, even if it was politicized on the part of Dr. Ford. She also could not. I'm not necessarily here to actually make a claim as to whether or not I think she is innocent or guilty. I, in on the Watchdog, have already made plainly clear what I think about the testimonies on this, okay? And if you're interested in that, go watch those episodes of the Watchdog. Any episode that Kavanaugh's on, I have made very plainly obvious what my opinions on the situation are. However, 
So the fact of the matter is there's not enough evidence either way for us to determine what actually happened. So I'm going to continue on through this video as if both party could be correct. Obviously, one party is wrong, but I'm going to continue on this video as if both parties could be correct. Now, what does the scripture have to say about this situation? Well, first, the question would be, what does the scripture say about rape? Let's assume for a second that Judge Brett Kavanaugh is, in fact, Justice Brett Kavanaugh at this point, is, in fact, guilty of uh, the crime of rape or of uh, an attempted rape, right? I guess he didn't actually... Um, finish in in this particular situation according to Ford's testimony thankfully of course if, if it did happen that is definitely a thankful thing um, a fortunate thing rather so let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 22 okay and I'm, of course I'm going to be reading it off this phone here we're going to start at verse 23 okay and we're going to read to verse 29 so we're going to read a total of seven verses here I'm going to be reading out of the King James version um, in this particular version or in this particular verse it may actually have a pretty significant difference in that the language may indicate that um, once we get to 2829, the language may indicate that they are, in fact, talking about a rape in 2829, when, in fact, if you read the Hebrew, it's patently obvious that they're not. If you have any questions about that, uh, you can actually check out Unapologetics, Does the Bible Endorse Rape? And I actually cover that subject entirely. But nonetheless, uh, we're reading out of the King James Version here. Most versions will read exactly like mine, not all. But nonetheless, let's continue here. And this is going to be... Deuteronomy chapter 22, starting at verse 23, and we're going to go to verse 29 and see what the Bible has to say about rapists. Okay. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto an husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out unto the gate of the city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife, so, that shall, uh, so thou shalt put away evil from among you. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lie with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death, for as when a man riseth against his neighbor, and slayeth him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found, then the man um, that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he hath humbled her, he may not put her away all the days, all of his days. Um, now, real quick, I just want to briefly state, like I already said, check out the Unapologetics Does the Bible Endorse Rape if you want to see further into the situation, if any of your renderings rendered that as a slightly more aggressive thing. Um, the fact of the matter is, verses 28 and 29 are actually not talking about a rape. You can see this in the Hebrew because the language is actually completely different. Um, the term humbled simply means that she's not a virgin anymore, right? So, now that we've kind of gotten that dealt with. So, what does this have to say? Okay, well, if we start here in verse 23, it says, If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto a husband and man find her in the city and lie with her. Okay, and then it says what? And you shall bring them both out of the gate of the city, and you shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife, so thou shalt put away evil from among you. So, what are we finding in this situation? Well, a, a, a female needs to actually cry out, which in our modern vernacular would probably be better rendered as report, a crime in order to be believed. If she is not reporting the crime, if she is not crying out, then she is assumed to not be um, telling the truth. Okay, That is the word of the scripture. And so right off of the bat, we have a very serious problem with all three accusations leveled against Kavanaugh from a biblical perspective, because according to the scriptures, you must cry out, which and again, in our modern vernacular, when we're not so tight-knit, close together, right? you must report if you are to be taken seriously. Okay, and there's a lot of very patently obvious reasons for this. The first of which, which everybody who's watching the Kavanaugh hearings, who has watched the Kavanaugh hearings, should realize, is that all evidence is gone if you do not report. Okay? There is no way to prove you didn't willingly have sex with the person. There's no way to prove you had sex with the person, period. There's no way to prove that the person was violent with you. There's no way to prove that you weren't um, going out of your way to try and um, 
and trap them in some way. There was no way to prove whether or not they had any sort of weapons or anything like that, whether or not anyone was with them, right? Witness stories start to get hazy. You just simply can't actually get to anyone if you don't report the crime, right? Furthermore, it is a very common, though I wouldn't say it's close to 50%, it is still very common for women to accuse somebody of rape when they have been caught for something, namely cheating, namely um, having sex with somebody who is older than them, right, etc. Of course, not significantly older. Anybody who has sex with a 12-year-old needs to be shot outside, right? We all understand that. But this is something that has definitely been used by women to... Um, try and get themselves out of trouble, or try to get their ex-boyfriends, ex-husbands, people who they did not like, people who they didn't enjoy the sex with, etc., in trouble. And I know all this is going to be really controversial for a lot of people, but let's just be perfectly frank here, okay? We know that a whole lot of rape crimes in the modern day are bull, okay? We know that for a fact. Again, I'm not saying it's 50%, I'm not saying it's over 50%, I'm not even saying it's 40 or 30%. It is definitely prevalent. And according to the scriptures, in this particular case, both Ford and Kavanaugh, if they did actually have sex, was of course, this was alleged to be attempted, so you can't really say anything, but they would both have to be stoned, okay? They would both have to be stoned, because Kavanaugh obviously can't be proven innocent or guilty, so they don't take that chance, they stone him anyway, as would Ford for not reporting the situation. She did not cry out, and therefore her story is to not be believed. Now, it does say, if we go further down, um... But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and the man force her, and lie with her, then the man only that lie with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death, for as when a man rises against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. So we see here that there is, of course, a situation where it is acceptable for a woman to not cry out or not report in this particular scenario. Newsflash! This more than likely does not apply to literally about 95% of all situations that exist in the modern world, okay? Why? Well, because if you're out in the middle of the field, back then, that meant there was nobody to find you. Nowadays, typically, we have cell phones, we have computers, we have cars to get to certain places. Not always, of course. There are certain situations where this is still a verse that applies to the modern world, most definitely, okay? Um... Virtually any situation where somebody has a gun to you and forces you to get in the shower in order to cover their own tracks, right? We've seen that happen numerous times. That is kind of a situation that is along these lines, although for the record, you should still report if that happens, okay? But for the most part, this situation doesn't happen anymore. The, mo the advent of modern technology, the advent of modern transportation, the advent of being able to harness radio waves and transmit information via them instantaneously has made this particular verse essentially not related it's just not something that we act that applies to us anymore right if it did of course though only the male in the situation is to be stoned and if we go further down to 28 and 29 it says that if she is not betrothed of course then she needs to go to the father and pay the father right and the father can reject if he likes okay now if we go here we can actually check out and see for a moment I'm sorry, I kind of cut off here a little bit. Anyways, but what I was going to say is if we go to Exodus, um, specifically chapter 22, verses 16 and 17, we see that the Father has the ability to reject this dowry. It doesn't tell us exactly what happens in, this, in the specific Deuteronomy case when he ex rejects this dowry, being that the dowry is a punishment. But we can only assume, knowing that the Lord has already twice announced that the rapist gets stoned to death for raping, right, that it isn't particularly pretty for the person who is rejected in this in this instance, right? Um, now, that is what happens to rapists, okay? If, if Kavanaugh genuinely did um, attempt to rape Dr. Ford, regardless of if he's in the city or out, regardless of if he's in a place where she can report or not, he still gets stoned. That is what the Bible says, okay? He gets stoned to death, and they purge this from Israel. They purge this evil from Israel, as the Bible puts it. However, that being said, if it is within the city and Dr. Ford does not actually decide she is going to um, report that she's not going to cry out, then she is considered to be guilty as well as her story, can, story cannot be proven, and therefore we don't know if it's true. And of course, I would just like to point out how patently obvious it is that this should be something that happens, right? This would get rid of a whole bunch of the false accusations of rape 
and it would get rid of a whole bunch of the situations in which a rapist is actually being let go if we actually had laws that said you need to report these crimes so we can get the evidence, so we can find the man, so we can put him in the dirt once we find him guilty. Okay. But what does the Bible have to say about false accusations? That is the next question. What if it is that Kavanaugh is telling the truth? Well, of course, we all know Exodus 20.16, which says, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, as one of the Ten Commandments. And, of course, I would just like to point out, the Lord our God is so uh, vehement, is so strongly opposed to lying, he hates lying, that he would actually go as far as to put this as one of the top ten laws in the entire world. Okay, there's a total of 613 of them. This is in the top ten. Okay. And, of course, there are, and I'm going to read some brief ones here real quick, there are some other laws that say uh, roughly the same thing. There is one law that says if you have, you know, having a good conscience so that when you are, not law, but verse, uh, 1 Peter 3.16, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So, um, hopefully we have Kavanaugh doing that. But, um, there is one, there are two um, particular things I want to say here, okay? The first one is Exodus 23.1. You shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. Okay. Again, we see very, very strong condemnation okay, of giving a false report. The Lord our God does not approve of giving a false report. He does not approve of joining together with a man who would like to give a false report. Okay. These are the facts of the matter. But let's go a little bit deeper. Maybe there is something else here that the Lord would like to say. And as it turns out, there actually is. Specifically, false accusations are brought up. Okay? And this is going to be in Deuteronomy. We're going to go to Deuteronomy chapters 19 and 18. Okay? So Deuteronomy chapters 19, verses 18 and 19. Sorry, I said chapters 19 and 18. I meant verses 18 and 19 from Deuteronomy. Okay? This is, again, I'm reading out of the King James Version. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. Behold, if the witness be a false witness, and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you. Let's read that again, shall we? And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness, and hath testified falsely against his brother... Then shall, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> then shall ye do unto him, as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you. You see, according to the scriptures, a false accuser is to get the punishment that the accused would have received. So in this particular case, if Dr. Christine Blaisley Ford is in fact accusing Brett Kavanaugh falsely of raping her, and if the punishment according to the Bible for raping somebody is in fact death by stoning, then Dr. Ford is now twice now guilty of, if she is indeed lying, right, guilty of a crime that the Bible suggests needs death by stoning. The first one is not crying out, the second one is a false accusation. Now, of course, that does assume that she is falsely accusing um, Judge Kavanaugh in this situation, but it just goes to show just how strongly the Lord condemns false accusations. If you falsely accuse against somebody who is your brother or sister, whatever it is that they should be, whatever it is that the accusation you levied against them, whatever punishment it is that that carries, that punishment will be levied against you once you are found to be a false witness, okay? And in this particular instance, the Lord our God prescribes stoning people to death for raping other people, okay? So, in the case of a false witness when it comes to rape, the Lord our God prescribes stoning false accusers of rape to death, okay? That is how strongly he opposes these situations. And, of course, we've already seen that he demands, he demands you cry out and or report, right? Like I said, that would be the modern vernacular of saying this, report. We don't live in the same situation as we did back then, but it's the same general concept, okay? You can't wait 36 years until there's absolutely no evidence and then come out with an accusation that may or may not be true, okay? And think about that. If it's not true, 
Well, then, of course, you're just slandering some guy's reputation and dragging his uh, name through the dirt for absolutely no reason. But if it is true, there's absolutely nothing that we can do about it, so we can't actually get this rapist off of the streets anyway. Regardless, you have screwed us the law, okay? And I want to make that perfectly clear, okay? Because I, I, like I said, I have my opinions on the situation, but regardless of what my opinions are on the situation, it needs to be made plainly clear. Rape is a crime punishable by death. False accusation is a crime punishable by whatever the crime the accused uh, is accused of um, demands, whatever the punishment is for that crime, right? Those are the punishments here, and if you do not report, if you do not cry out, you are not to be believed. We see this in our own situation outside of the Bible with the United States Constitution saying you are innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, by a jury of your peers, you can face your accuser, you must have equal representation, and they must come to a unanimous vote, you also cannot be charged with double jeopardy. This is all our big fancy way of saying exactly what the Bible says, which is namely, if you are a false accuser, we are in no way, shape, or form going to um, allow your accusations to go through. The innocent are innocent until they are proven guilty, and forget this believe survivors nonsense. It is nonsense. No survivor, quote unquote, of any crime deserves to be believed unless the evidence is there. And notice I use the word deserves, okay? If you do believe Dr. Ford, that's fine. Perfectly okay, okay? I'm not actually making the claim right now that she's lying. If you do believe her, that's perfectly okay. You have your reasons, present those reasons. All right, but making the claim here now that she should just definitely be believed, no questions asked, simply because she's an accuser of rape, that's absolutely insane. It's completely ridiculous. It is a way that we get kids like 14-year-old Emmett Till literally killed by lynch mobs, okay? That's what happens when you, quote, believe survivors. That's why we have a court system. That's why you need witnesses, according to the Bible. That is why you need to report. You need to report. It's not an option. You need to report. You must cry out, is what the scriptures say. Or, we have no obligation whatsoever to believe your story. And if you are a false witness, then whatever punishment was going to be levied against the accused will be levied against you. If you are not a false witness, well, I'm sorry, Mr. Kavanaugh, but the Bible prescribes stoning until death. Now, to end this situation, I would like to briefly say, we're not actually under the New Testament law right now. Those are, of course, law, um, God's perfect prescriptions for a perfect government. We, of course, cannot enact them, which is why we have our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who came and died for our sins, rose from the dead, all that kind of stuff, right? And so, great news about all this situation is... Whichever party in this situation is guilty, whether Ford is a false accuser or Kavanaugh is an attempted rapist, regardless, they do actually have the ability to repent genuinely in their heart, to seek the Lord Jesus Christ to say, I am sorry for what I've done. I'm sorry for dragging an innocent man's name through the mud, or I'm sorry for attempting to rape a young 15-year-old girl. Shouldn't have done it. It's wicked. I deserve death because of what I've done. Lord, your will be done with me. And you know what the Lord says? He'll forgive you. That's what he says. He says he will forgive you. And I, again, whichever one is guilty, because we've already read from the Bible, both, you know, the Bible says all sin is punishable by death. And that is true. But the, the Bible is talking about death as in, you know, we, we all are eventually going to die. That is the curse upon us. We were supposed to live forever in the Garden of Eden, and of course we're not going to now as a result of sin. But the Bible is also saying these two crimes in particular, whichever one is actually happening here, false accusation or rape, both of these crimes are punishable by death from the legal uh, bodies that be, according to the scriptures. Okay, So we know both of these people are deserving to die if they're guilty. Okay, obviously, one of the other side is not. Um, in the case of Ford, technically she still is as a result of not reporting. But realistically speaking, you know, I, I, I am definitely willing to forgive that considering the fact that we're not under a biblical law. We live in a different, we have a different mentality these days, right? And so I certainly understand why a victim in America would be less inclined to report, whereas a victim in Israel would not. This this Deuteronomy 22 law is a very big part of that. Okay? But nonetheless, we already know that whichever party is guilty, they are guilty of death. Okay? Regardless. 
the Lord Jesus Christ says they can repent, they can seek him, they can come to know him, and they can wake up with him in paradise as brothers and sisters with each other, right? Um, and of course, that would be a beautiful thing to see. So, that is uh, everything I have to say about the Kavanaugh situation, although I do want to briefly state, and I've said this numerous times on The Watchdog, and I'll say this from a religious perspective, you know, Brett Kavanaugh is a uh, Roman Catholic, and that means we now have, I believe, seven Roman Catholics who are um, who are on the Supreme Court. The leader of the NSA is a Roman Catholic. The First Lady is a Roman Catholic. Um, there's a lot of power going to the Roman Catholic Church at the moment. And you know what? I'm just going to be perfectly frank with it. Brett Kavanaugh is not going to repeal Roe v. Wade. Brett Kavanaugh is not going to be down with our gun control rights. Brett Kavanaugh is not going to be down with our free speech rights. And Brett Kavanaugh does not want us to have the ability to investigate the president. This is one of the worst conservative nominations ever. And as far as Christians are concerned, we should be very frightened. We should be very worried, okay? But that is a subject for another episode of Unapologetics. So let's say a brief prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for allowing me to make this video, Lord. I want to thank you for giving me the ability to say these things, Lord, for giving me the right to say these things in this country, Lord. We, of course, know that many countries don't have these rights. I want to thank you for the reading of your word and your amazing laws, your Lord, your amazing forgiveness for when we break these laws, Lord. I pray that whoever it is that is guilty in this situation, Lord, that you touch their heart and lead them to repent and to seek you. And I ask these things in Jesus Christ's name, and we give you all the glory. Amen. Now, thank you very much for watching this video, guys. Um, please do like and share. If you liked this video, comment any question, comment, or concern in the comment section below. Uh, we will provide some links to the articles read here in the description below. Um, and of course, if you, if you consistently enjoy our content, please do subscribe here to the American Cynic Party channel. You can find links on our About um, here on YouTube, where you'll find links to ACP Official on Gab, Cynic Thought on Instagram, the American Cynic Party on Facebook, and, um, shoot, what was the fourth one? I can't even remember. And uh, AC, or Terrestrial Earthbird, rather. On Twitter. These are our four other accounts. Please do follow us on Twitter, follow us on Gab, like us on Facebook, and uh, follow us on Instagram. We certainly appreciate all of the support. Um, God bless you guys. It's been a pleasure doing this video for you. I love doing these videos. I'm glad to actually finally be getting these videos consistently up like I promised you guys, and I thank you very much for your support. Uh, shalom, and have a great rest of your evening. God bless.